It was back in November 2003. College student Drew Shadeen went missing from a shopping mall in Grand Forks. When Drew Shadeen mysteriously vanished from the Columbia Mall parking lot after her shift at work on the 22nd of November 2003, the community immediately jumped into action to try and find her. Everybody ready? Let's find her today. Let's go get Drew. For months, throughout the long winter, search teams scoured farm fields in Minnesota the last place her cell phone was traced. Hundreds of members of the community, police officers and the FBI spent months looking for her. But sadly, five months later, her body was found in a ravine. The police already knew who was behind her kidnapping and murder and had already arrested someone five months earlier. Their suspect had a horrendous criminal record and had just been released from jail. 17 years early. Well, let's put his record up on the screen for people to see because it's frankly, it's mind boggling. He's sentenced to 15 years. He's released in 1979 after only four years. In 1980, he's convicted. Then he's released and then uh, he's arrested again. He had only spent six years in jail instead of the 23 he was originally sentenced with. Why on earth was this monster on the streets and living amongst the community? Why had he been given another chance to commit such horrible crimes against innocent women? This is the devastating story of Drew's abduction and murder and how her death led to changes in the law. There was a report that came out just recently that said that he is, he has tendencies towards violence towards women. How does a guy like this get out? Drew Katrina Shadeen was born on the 26th of September 1981 in Minneapolis, Minnesota to her parents Alan Shadeen and Linda Walker. As her parents divorced when she was a toddler, Drew and her brother Sven were brought up by their mother Linda and their stepfather Sid Walker in Whitefish Lake. Drew was a gifted athlete and excelled in playing basketball, volleyball and golf, but her real passion was for art. She was a talented artist who enjoyed painting and drawing and she loved photography. Her childhood nickname was Doodles. Her room at home was filled with her sketches of rock stars, models and her friends. Her stepfather Sid said, She was always artistic. I'd look and see a blank. She'd look and see depth, variety and beauty. It was just natural for her. Drew was incredibly kind and loving and often volunteered. She took underprivileged children bowling, raised money for organizations like the American Diabetes Association, and while in college, she participated in events that raised awareness for violence against women and children. On the first day of ninth grade, when the teacher directed that the students choose a partner, Drew immediately selected the girl who had recently transferred to the school and knew no one else. She took the new girl under her wing and they quickly became lifelong friends. Drew blossomed in high school, becoming an honor student, joining the golf team, and getting elected homecoming queen in 1999. In the spring of 2000, Drew graduated from her high school and went on to attend the University of North Dakota where she studied visual art. She interned through the university's aviation program and enjoyed traveling as a benefit of it. Drew enjoyed being part of her sorority, and through it, she worked with underprivileged teens while holding two jobs, as well as carrying a full academic schedule. Drew started dating a man called Chris Lang, and their relationship was filled with love and happiness. Chris said he was drawn to her smile, and that Drew made him feel wonderful about himself. Drew even told her friends that she may have met the guy she wanted to marry. Chris said, She's a wonderful woman. You meet her for five minutes and feel like you've known her your whole life. She loves people, loves to laugh, a very caring person. And her picture, her picture speaks miles of her. You get to know her from seeing that smile. That smile is infectious. Overall, things were going well in Drew's life, and she was excelling in everything. She was looking forward to the future, even planning a trip to Australia in the spring of the following year. But sadly, this would all change when Drew mysteriously vanished on the 22nd of November, 2003. At around 4pm on the evening of the 22nd of November, 2003, 
Drew Shadeen finished her shift at the Victoria's Secret store, located in the Columbia Mall in Grand Forks in North Dakota. After shopping for and purchasing a new purse from Marshall Fields, Drew left the mall around 5pm and began walking to her car. As she walked through the parking lot, she called her boyfriend Chris Lang to say hi and she told him about the purse she had just purchased. Four minutes into their conversation, Chris said he heard Drew say okay okay to someone else before the call abruptly ended at 5.04pm. Chris thought nothing of it as he suspected that the call was just dropped and because he didn't hear any sense of urgency in Drew's voice. He said, I did not know the sense of urgency of this phone call at the time. There was no sense of urgency, more just a cell phone call being cut off for any number of reasons. About three hours later, at 7.42pm, Chris received another call from her cell phone, but this time, he only heard static and the sound of buttons being pressed, and the call was cut off after 55 seconds. He immediately tried to call her back, but there was no reply. Growing concerned, Chris decided to call Drew's roommate, Meg Murphy, to see if she had arrived back home, but Meg said she hadn't. Meg then checked at the hospitals in the area to see if Drew had been injured, but she wasn't reported to be in any hospitals. Shortly after 9pm, somebody at the El Rocco nightclub phoned their apartment to find out why she had not shown up for work. Drew worked a second job as a waitress at the nightclub and apparently she hadn't arrived that night. Meg and Chris were now incredibly concerned for Drew's safety and her whereabouts so Meg notified the university campus security and the police quickly became involved. A couple of hours later, at 11pm, police found Drew's car in the Columbia Mall parking lot. The passenger side door was unlocked and the Marshalls Field shopping bag, her credit card and her planner were still inside. Outside the vehicle, police found a black nylon sheath with the words tool shop in white letters on it. With this suspicious scene, they knew they had to find Drew Shadeen as quickly as possible, so the intense search began. In the following days after Drew's disappearance, authorities organised a massive search effort, employing as many as 75 law enforcement officers, including 15 FBI agents. The residents of Grand Forks were so deeply touched and affected by Drew's disappearance that when officials issued a plea for volunteers to help, 1,300 people answered the call and they fanned out across the countryside to look for her. Volunteers lined up early for another massive search. Once they were checked in, they were bussed out. We're gonna fan out and we're gonna go this whole coolie drive. It's one mile. The county sheriff said they were motivated by Drew that just drives someone when it's coming from the heart. Her family appealed to the public to keep searching and tried to reach out to Drew through the media and told her to not give up hope. Her father, Alan Shadeen, said, Honey, we are still looking for you. We know you're there. Our strength is drawn from you. What we want is everyone to continue doing what they're doing, just like these folks are saying. Check shelter belts, buildings, check everything. We want information. We have the strength. We will continue. Honey, we are going to find you. Her brother Sven said, We are a strong family and we know she is out there. She is a strong girl. I know we are just round the corner from you, Drew, and we'll see you in a while. We love you. As part of the investigation, they started work analyzing Drew's cell phone records. They were able to determine that the phone had been left on, but not used until 8 p.m. the day after she disappeared, when either someone turned it off or the battery went dead. They discovered that the signal from the phone had been pinging off a cell tower in Fisher's Landing, a highway rest stop in Minnesota, 12 miles southeast of Grand Forks. A week and a half after Shadeen's disappearance, searchers are still dedicated, but what they may find has them worried. It's scary. Um, you want to hope you find something and you want to hope you don't find something, you know. It, it's just mixed emotions. It, it's very, it's an eerie feeling. But volunteers push on. I gotta put myself in, in her mother's situation or her father's situation. I would want to be, you know, I'd want my loved one found one way or another, if it's dead or alive, just to have closure. Although they found no trace of Drew, a week later, on the 1st of December 2003,
the police announced that they had arrested a man on charges of kidnapping in connection with Drew's disappearance. This man was 50-year-old Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. and he was a registered level 3 sex offender. They said they had arrested him as they could place Rodriguez not only in Grand Forks at the time of her disappearance, but also in the parking lot of the shopping center where she worked. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. became a suspect four days into the investigation after police received a tip stating he'd been in Grand Forks the day Drew Shadeen vanished. According to police reports, Alfonso admitted being near the Columbia Mall the night Drew disappeared, but he said he was watching a movie at the mall's theater, the film Once Upon a Time in Mexico. The problem was, however, that this movie was not playing at the cinema or any other theater in the area. Alfonso could not explain why he said he was watching a movie that was not showing. Tell us that you went to the movie theater, but uh, that doesn't really pan out. We're having trouble finding you on the McDonald's videotape. Do you think maybe you were actually somewhere else rather than the movie theater? I don't know. Well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know I wasn't small when this girl was abducted. Investigators also found a three-hour gap between the time Drew disappeared and the time Alfonso showed up at the home he shared with his mother in Crookston, Minnesota, which was just over the border from North Dakota. Also, looking back at Drew's phone records, they discovered that the signal from the phone had been pinging off a cell tower in Fisher's Landing. As it turned out, the Fisher's Landing tower was roughly midway between Grand Forks and Alfonso's home in Crookston. With Alfonso being a prime suspect, they received consent to search his car, and they found a mountain of evidence. They found a four-inch folding knife in his car that apparently was only sold at a local hardware store as a pair with the sheath, with the similar branding to the one they had found outside Drew's car that had the words tool shop in white letters on. They also found blood on the passenger side rear window and in the back seat, as well as two other areas in the passenger compartment. The sheriff said, the blood did come back, it was a DNA match with Drew from the DNA taken from Drew's toothbrush. In addition, a black loafer belonging to Drew was found beneath the bridge along the bank of the Red Lake River in the days after her disappearance. The bridge was on a highway heading into Crookston, Alfonso's hometown, about 25 miles east of Grand Forks. All fingers pointed to Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. But why on earth was a level 3 sex offender even out of jail and living amongst the community in the first place? Well, let's put his record up on the screen for people to see because it's frankly, it's mind boggling. Look at this. In 1974, he commits uh, two rapes. In 1975, Rodriguez is, is, uh, is sentenced to 15 years. He's released in 1979 after only four years. I think it was a lawyer that put him in some sort of a... Uh, some sort of a hospital. Then in 1980, he stabs and threatens a woman. Uh, in 1980, he's convicted of aggravated assault. Then he's released, and then uh, he's arrested again. And apparently, there was a report that came out just recently that said that he is, he has tendencies towards violence towards women. How does a guy like this get out? Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. was the second oldest of five children, born in Texas on the 18th of February 1953 to his parents Dolores and Alfonso Rodriguez Sr. The family moved for 15 years between Texas and the Red River Valley before finally settling in Crookston, Minnesota in 1963. As a baby, Alfonso was small, fussy and sickly, and when he was unable to tolerate breast milk, the doctor recommended that his mother feed him rice water. When he was four months old, Alfonso was on the verge of starvation and his condition was so poor that his doctor diagnosed him with failure to thrive. Alfonso was slow to achieve developmental milestones and even as an adult, he never lived independently. Alfonso claims to have had an unhappy childhood, describing his home life as unpleasant because his parents were highly critical of him and unreasonable in their demands. Alfonso's father beat the children, the boys more so with a belt, and he would call Alfonso names like stupid and big head. Dolores described her son as different, a slow learner, quiet and withdrawn, and out of step with the other children. Alfonso's preferred language was Spanish, and he struggled with English, 
which made school challenging for him, and he became increasingly isolated from everything. He would often sit quietly and watch other children play, quickly becoming an outsider. In court documents, it's said that when Alfonso was four or five years old, he was sent away with his older sister, Sylvia, to stay at a camp for migrant children while his parents worked in the fields. Apparently, it was here that Alfonso was sexually abused by a female for the first time, and his older sister, Sylvia, witnessed the abuse. This abuse carried on throughout his childhood by multiple different men and women. Over time, Alfonso eventually dropped out of school during the ninth grade and began working as a labourer at the American Crystal Sugar Factory plant in Crookston. In October 1974, at the age of just 21, Alfonso asked a woman for a ride home, and instead he directed her to a driveway in Crookston, where he grabbed her by the throat and pulled her back in the car, and then he tried to assault her at knife point. Only a month later, he approached another woman, who was sitting in a truck outside of a movie theatre, and here he threatened her with a knife and ordered her to drive to a secluded location in the countryside where he raped her. The police finally caught up with Alfonso and arrested him, and he pleaded to aggravated rape and to attempted aggravated rape and was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 1975. During his time at prison, Alfonso was evaluated and treated at the Minnesota Security Hospital in St. Peter, where he was psychologically assessed and found to have a history of anxiety and depression as well as an alcoholic personality disorder with some paranoid, schizoid, and antisocial tendencies. While on furlough from the hospital, Alfonso was accused of attacking another woman, for which he was later acquitted. And then, in 1979, he attempted to abduct and sexually assault a 69-year-old junior high school teacher while she was out walking one night in Crookston. The woman fought back, however, and Alfonso tried to force her into his car, and in a fit of anger, he stabbed her with a knife in the elbow and abdomen. However, she managed to break free and run to safety. Incredibly, the woman was then able to draw a composite sketch of Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. that closely resembled him and led to his capture. This time he was convicted for attempted kidnapping and aggravated assault and sent to prison for 23 years. During his incarceration, Alfonso refused sexual offender treatment and was only counseled for chemical dependency. Authorities said he was a well-behaved prisoner, and he only had one disciplinary offence during his incarceration. Officials said that during his time in prison, Alfonso showed no signs to re-offend, and in February 2001, an evaluation board recommended that he not be considered for a civil confinement, even after he finished serving his sentence. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. himself expressed anxiety and fear of living back in society, saying he wanted to be locked up, but not locked up. Even his family called the Minnesota Department of Corrections and expressed concerns about Rodriguez's upcoming release and the likely lack of supervision and guidance he would get. However, despite all these red flags, Alfonso was released on the 1st of May 2003, despite his sentencing originally being 23 years. Upon his release, Alfonso moved into his mother's house in Crookston and took on a few jobs, including working on a construction project hanging drywall. Drew's disappearance happened just seven months after he was released from jail. Alfonso's victim from 1974 had this to say about his continuous releases. Your incident was 1974, Drew Shadeen incident was 2003, and it would uh, seem by now this would have been ended a long time ago in prison for life or the death penalty. It just goes on and on. Absolutely. It does go on and on. And when I think about the number of times I've come back to testify or to partner with an investigation um, regarding his actions, some days it feels like it ha <laughs> that 47 years is not long enough. It feels like 100 years that this has been going on. And I think um, as a survivor, each time one of these happens, it really negates the voice of the victim because one has to question, what would be enough? When will it be enough?
Here's the latest on Drew Shadeen. She's the young student who has been missing for three weeks. The National Guard has been called in to help in the search, while the man accused of kidnapping her, Alfonso Rodriguez, still refuses to talk to authorities. Months passed, but they still could not find Drew's body. It's a thick area in here. Uh, the wind, of course, there was no snow uh, on the 22nd. Predominantly, the wind is out of the northwest. We received snow, so there's some places where the snow is going to be waist deep. Uh, I want them to check in the areas, go in there, kick it up. They knew Alfonso was the one who had kidnapped her and likely hurt her. So they tried to make a plea bargain with Alfonso and said they would take the death penalty off the table if he led them to the location of Drew's body. Up until now, however, Alfonso claimed that he was innocent and therefore had no knowledge as to where her body was. More months passed with an ongoing intensive search for Drew. Five months after Alfonso's arrest, however, searchers finally located Drew's body just outside of Crookston in Minnesota. On the 17th of April 2004, Drew's partially nude body was recovered, and it was found as the deep snow in a ravine around the Crookston area had began to melt. Her hands were tied behind her back, and she had been beaten, stabbed, sexually assaulted, and had several lacerations, including a five and a half inch cut on her neck. A rope was also tied around her neck, and remnants of a shopping bag were found under the rope, suggesting that a bag had been placed on her head. The medical examiner concluded that she had either died as a result of the major neck wound or from suffocation. Under a month later, on May the 11th, 2004, Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. was finally charged with kidnapping and killing Drew Shadeen. Because Drew had been taken across state lines, the crime became a federal case under the Federal Kidnapping Act. This meant that Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. was eligible to receive the death penalty if convicted, and it was the first death penalty case in a century to take place in North Dakota. In the end, due to the overwhelming evidence against Alfonso, and because of his criminal background, on the 30th of August 2006, he was convicted in federal court of kidnapping resulting in death for the murder of Drew Shadeen. And on the 22nd of September 2006, the jury recommended that he receive the death penalty. US District Judge Ralph Erickson was the one to formally sentence Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. to death on February the 8th, 2007. And he told Rodriguez that he had caused pain that staggers the intellect. He called the kidnapping and murder of Drew Shadeen a crime that cries out to the heaven for retribution. Throughout the two-hour proceeding, Alfonso Rodriguez just stared forward, straight ahead, and he just answered no when the judge asked if he wanted to say anything. Alfonso's sister and mother were in court to hear the hearing, and before the sentence was imposed, 16 of Drew's family members and friends gave emotional victim impact statements. Linda Walker, Drew's mother, said, there isn't a minute of the day that doesn't go by where I have the overwhelming void, wanting to pick up the phone and talk to her, hear from her, hold her. I don't know that there'll ever be peace. I'm going to just have to somehow, once again, put one foot in front of the other and try to make sense out of the rest of my life. Alan Shadeen, Drew's father, said, She's with me every second of every day. She's a constant thought. She's always there, patting me on the back and being part of my very being. That inspiration will never go, and it's always a drive. US attorney Drew Wrigley calls the sentence fair and just. He said Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. caused a lifetime of pain for the family and friends of Drew Shadeen, saying, we deeply regret the number of bad days that have been for Drew's family, initially and throughout, but I do think we have a sense of agreement. There is a sense of peace in hard-won justice. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. was imprisoned at University States Penitentiary in Indiana, and Judge Erickson arranged that he would be executed in South Dakota. A few years later, however, Alfonso Rodriguez's defense attorneys filed a federal habeas corpus motion claiming that Alfonso Rodriguez was mentally disabled and that this could change his sentence. Drew's mother, Linda Walker, said this about the situation. He's an evil person, and uh, evil people uh, tend to always want to use each and every opportunity to shine spotlight on themselves. And um, 
he does not want to be executed, so he's using each and every opportunity given to him uh, to ensure that that doesn't happen. A federal judge has overturned that death sentence, writing, while it is beyond question that Rodriguez abducted and murdered Shadeen, errors were made that violate the United States Constitution. The judge cited misleading testimony about Shadeen's cause of death and a failure to present information about Rodriguez's mental health that might have raised an insanity defense. Although his conviction still stands, the judge ordered a new sentencing. Now this part is quite confusing, and I'm definitely not a lawyer in any sense, but I've tried to dissect the information and put it together and make it as clear as possible. But in the end, after questions and issues were raised by Rodriguez and his team about the case, the government was granted an extension of time to conduct its own evaluations and to respond to the issues raised in the motion. They looked into it to find out whether there had been any jury misconduct issues, any forensics issues, and any mental health issues. In the end, they found that Ramsey County Medical Examiner Michael McGee presented unsupported, misleading, and inaccurate testimony regarding the cause of Drew's death. They said that his testimony was unreliable, misleading, and inaccurate, and it turned out that 70 cases from Dr. McGee's tenure were under additional review. The circumstances surrounding Drew's death were instrumental in advancing the government's arguments for why this case, in particular, should receive a death sentence over other murder cases. They also concluded that Alfonso Rodriguez's attorneys did him a disservice by opting to limit the mental health evaluation of Alfonso himself, which could have resulted in the possible use of the insanity defence. They said the defence should have done more to challenge a medical examiner's findings. An adequate investigation would have exposed a possible insanity defence and potentially indicate that Alfonso Rodriguez suffered from some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder that was so severe that he sometimes has dissociative experiences. But this evidence was not developed for trial. Instead, the government told the jury repeatedly that this case was about his intentional and deliberate choices. A choice to search for a female, a choice to sexually assault that female, and a choice to kill that female. If the jury had heard evidence about the severity of his mental health condition, there was a reasonable probability that at least one juror would have struck a different balance and voted to impose a life sentence rather than a death sentence. In the end, in 2021, the same judge who sentenced Alfonso Rodriguez to death, Ralph Erickson, ended up throwing out the death sentence and ordered that a new sentencing phase be conducted due to, as he said, misleading testimony from a medical examiner and limitations on mental health evidence, saying that new evidence showed that the medical examiner was guessing on the stand and defence lawyers did not adequately explore mental health evidence. On the 18th of May 2023, Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. was sentenced to life without parole. US Attorney for North Dakota, Max Schneider said, the directive to withdraw the death notice has changed how the United States Attorney's Office will proceed with this case. What will not change is that Mr. Rodriguez will draw his last breath in a federal prison. The system failed Drew Shadeen in this case. The Minnesota Department of Corrections could have and should have sought to have Rodriguez, an untreated level 3 sex offender with a history of harming women who was expressing anxiety and grave fears about living in society, civilly committed. Under Minnesota law, Alfonso had to register with the state's Department of Corrections as a predatory offender, but he was not required to be under constant supervision. When he was released from prison in May, there was a town meeting to alert residents that he would be in the community and living with his mother, but this still created fear within the community. One of the residents said, I'm a widow and I'm older, and I was scared, so I had my son-in-law come over and install a motion light after he moved in. Another neighbour said, there was a lot of frightened people around. This case therefore led to changes in sex offender registration laws. On July the 27th, 2006, President George W. Bush signed the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act, 
which included Drew's Law. Drew's Law changed the name of the National Sex Offender Public Registry to the Drew Shadeen National Sex Offender Public Website, and this provides information to the public on the whereabouts of registered sex offenders, regardless of state, territory, or tribal boundaries. Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty said, Drew Shadeen's case was a wake-up call for legislators to consider new laws that would enable sex offenders to be imprisoned longer and face the death penalty when sexual assaults are coupled with murders or attempted murder. He said he's tired of hearing stories about convicted sex offenders preying upon victims after getting out of prison. He said, As a Minnesotan, as a governor, as a dad of two young daughters, I'm fed up. I'm fed up with these stories where we have children abducted, women abducted, with a not very good system for resolving the issue. I know this is strong language, particularly for Minnesota. Pushing for the death penalty will be an uphill battle, but I am going to push for it. He also called for legislation that would enable sex offenders to be tracked for the rest of their lives after their release from prison, perhaps with the global positioning system technology. He said, there are circumstances where sex offenders are not curable and they need to be incarcerated longer, be kept off the streets longer, or worse. Once they're released, they need to be tracked for the rest of their lives. We have the technology. In 2004, a scholarship in Drew Shadeen's name was set up at the University of North Dakota. You get on campus and you hear about what a wonderful and lively and talented woman Drew was and um, how her death really, really affected the community. You know, you hear about Drew, you know who Drew was, and you know what an impact she was on this campus. And to actually be named the recipient of the scholarship is a really, like, incomparable, like, I can't articulate what an honor it is to be uh, named the recipient for this. There's so much esteem for the scholarship. There's so much um, weight behind it. And I feel really blessed. I'm so happy that I can continue Drew's legacy um, and that this legacy is something that's so helpful for so many people. And a memorial garden for Shadeen opened in her hometown. Drew's mother, Linda, has also been doing some incredible work in her daughter's memory, and it's become her mission to break the silence of domestic violence. Linda said that she hoped Drew's memory would live through her work, and by raising awareness of domestic violence and telling Drew's story, that she could help the community become a safer place. It's changed me in ways I, I you know, obviously losing Drew through, through such a horrific crime in itself, but then to, to really uh, bring it full, full, uh, full circle by getting involved and seeing how collectively we can make a change. I was very naive as to all the issues surrounding um, sexual violence in the United States um, and becoming more and more aware. Um, it, it certainly has uh, changed me in ways that I, I could ever imagine. As always, my heart goes out to the Shadeen family and to everyone else who was affected by this heinous crime. Even though this tragic case had such a horrible outcome, at least now these perpetrators can hopefully be locked up for longer and be tracked for the rest of their lives.